Welcome to the Ooh, welcome to the Weedy Garden at night time. Shh. This is beautiful. Look how big she is there. G'day. And welcome back to the Weedy Garden at night time. Because it's night time where all the pests come out and create havoc in my garden. It's been three years since I started my garden. You know, on the first year you have a garden, you don't usually get many pests because they all have like a GPS thing zoned in and they know where their food is. But then there'll be the occasional one that flies a little bit off wind or walks in the wrong direction because he's been chased by a goanna or something. And he'll go, oh, what's that? And he'll, that animal then will come across your garden. Oh, it'll find some food. And then he'll go back and tell its friends. And then next year, there'll be four times as many pests in your garden. And the year after that, every animal in the neighborhood knows that you've got a garden up here. So at some point, you do have to deal with it. Well, it started with the, the cows, got that sorted. And then we had the kangaroos, got that sorted. We had the caterpillars, of course, in the beginning, got that sorted. The birds were eating my mulberries. That was very disappointing because they were beautiful mulberries. But I got that sorted. The rats and the mice, they kept eating my, my peas and my corn before they even had a chance to come up out of the ground. But I got that sorted. <laughs> and um, the boost turkey. The boost turkey created absolute havoc in my garden. And the boost turkey is still coming around. Actually, as it, as it falls night time here in the weedy garden, the bush turkey does come out. Where if I see it? I stamp my feet and I yell. But I actually have got that sorted as well. And what else is there? Uh, the bandicoot. The bandicoot has been also a real pest in my garden. But I got that sorted too. So if you live in Australia, you'll probably have to deal with all these pests at some point if you've got a garden. If you live overseas, there's probably some similar things that you have over there. But the thing is that animals, they are smart and they are part of nature. And the tree that gives the fruit does it for a reason because it wants to spread its seeds. So everything's doing the right thing. You just gotta live with nature and learn how to deal with it in the right way and respect it. And that's what we do here up in the weed garden. So in this video, I'm gonna share all the solutions that I found that work, okay? So enjoy this one. Oh, mosquitoes. That's another thing I can tell you about actually right here. If you don't want to get bitten by mosquitoes, just grab some of this. See, this is just mint. Just grab some mint like that. And just rub it on your skin. Just rub it on your skin like that. Wherever you want to put it and that'll keep the mosquitoes away. And if you do get bitten, then you can just rub some banana peel on, that should take the sting away. Okay, so, welcome back to another episode of The Weedy Garden at Night Time. It all started with the first electric fence to keep the cows out. Because before I came here, <coughs> it's turned on actually, she's. <laughs> Because before I came here, this was the cow spot. Because this is the best spot on the whole property. It's always sunny, it's got a great view. And beautiful breeze in the afternoon. So the electric fences kept the cows out. Um, except for once, when we had a lot of rain one summer and the garden grew like a jungle. And the grass and the pumpkins grew up over the fence down the back where I couldn't see it and one of the cows got in. But it does keep the cows out and that was the first thing I had to get under control. And so, so far, weedy one, cows zero. Gotta make sure I keep the grass and the weeds away from the fence because the, it'll short the fence out. But it doesn't stop the wallabies. It doesn't stop the bush turkey or the bandicoot. But it does stop the cows. Caterpillars, caterpillars and aphids and mites and all these little things. 
<laughs> it's so funny. In the beginning of the garden, I'd collect the little caterpillars and I'd take them away. And I was taking them away from the garden by hand. We don't want anything eating the leaves of the plants because the leaves is the solar panel. When we're talking about bugs and stuff in the garden, I think of it like an African savanna. And I think of the bugs as being like the lions. And I think of the plants as being like the zebra. See, the lions, they're not going to go after the strongest zebra. They're going to go after the weakest zebra. And so if I think about that, so the bugs, they're going after the weakest plants. To solve that problem, all you need to have is healthy soil, nice sunshine, and lots of water. Because if your plants are getting their full potential, they've got their own self-defense mechanism. Right? So the, the bugs are only looking for the weakest plants. So if you've got healthy plants, you should not have any bug problems. See, it's all about diversity of the plants, right? Just think about a butterfly. She's going to be flying in here looking for a cabbage. She's going to go, oh, there's a cabbage. She's going to turn. She's going to smell a garlic. She's going to turn. She's going to smell some flowers. She's going to turn. She's, kind of, she's lost that scent already because there's so much diversity, so many different pheromones, so many different smells that she's going to go somewhere else. So if you've got lots of herbs and flowers and vegetables and mix them all up together, that's another good way to keep the pests away because if you have a whole garden bed, for example, filled with your broccoli, that smell of the broccoli is going to whiff around the valley for miles and it's going to just attract them all. Oh, and they're going to come in and start munching away. Even though your plants are healthy, it doesn't mean they're not going to get attacked. It means that the weakest is going to get attacked. So there could be one or two plants that will get attacked by bugs or caterpillars. But what I usually do is I leave that. It's like, okay, they've attacked that, they're eating that, they're busy doing that, they're not gonna attack the other ones. Or you can take the plant away and move it away, like chop the plant off and move all the bugs and chuck it. So a lot of diversity, I've got flowers here, tomatoes, basil, spinach, curry plant over there, a thyme plant over there. Pineapple, corn, beans, all of these are within a few square meters of each other. That's enough to confuse any butterfly. You can also use a net. And I use nets sometimes as well. For example, over here, you know, because in here I've got strawberries and the little birdies and the little grubbies, they love the strawberries. So this is another good way to keep your bugs away. I didn't like to use netting in the beginning, but sometimes, you kind of just have to do what you have to do. Because you know, your food's your important thing. You spend a lot of time on the food to make it, to grow it, to look after it. It's a real shame when you lose it. So, netting. And then there's the mulberry tree. Oh, the first year, I had so many mulberries on the mulberry tree and it was looking beautiful. And I was waiting for them to become ripe. And I came out one day and all the ripe ones were gone bird had got into it, this little black bird with red eyes. So that was when I put the net on. I'm enjoying myself here underneath this net eating the biggest, juiciest, fattest, deliciousest mulberries because they're safe from the birds. The first time I put this net on, the bird got caught in, in it. The bird flew in underneath it and I caught it. And then I threw it in the air and let it go. And you know what? It didn't come back. Oh, this is so good. This is so good because there's all these beautiful mulberries untouched from the birds and the grubs. Oh, just fell. Because of this netting I've got here. It's a constant battle dealing with the pests, but once you've got a net on mulberry tree, you get all the mulberries you want. That's about all I can harvest from this tree today. See? They're beautiful. You can see I've been picking them. I'm just going to eat them right in front of the camera. Mmm. I think that'll do. I've got a few more left and then I'll take the net off and let it grow. So the next thing, the wallabies. How do I deal with the wallabies? Go on, go on, go on, go on, get out, get out, get out, get out. I still have to chase the wallabies out sometimes, but I think I've got that under control as well because they're usually only eating the bark of my avocado trees. So I put this wire netting around all my avocado trees you think I outsmart the wallabies? You bet I did. The first year or two, I put a little cover around them. And as they were getting bigger, I took the cover off. And then what happened? See how it ate all the bark around the tree? 
So what happens when the wallaby eats the bark? See, when the tree produces photosynthesis, it brings that energy down through the bark into the roots. So if there's no bark, it can't get sugar out into the roots, can't attract the bacteria, can't, can't feed. So that fixes it with a bit of wire netting. So the wallabies don't bother me anymore because they're not bothering my avocado trees. But they do come into the garden still because the electric fence doesn't stop them. But they come in and they only eat the grass. And when they eat the grass, they poop. So it's all good. It's a win-win at the moment with the wallabies. So I'm a little bit concerned for my little baby corn, but we'll see what happens. Hopefully there's enough grass around. All the other corn is up, up in my garden where the wallaby doesn't come because I think he's scared of my scarecrow. The birds and the bats. That was the next challenge. Before I started bagging my bananas, the bats, the parrots and the bush turkey were all helping themselves to my bananas. But since I've been bagging them, I'm getting beautiful fresh clusters without any holes in them at all. All with perfect bananas. Some of the birds I want for my bananas because they're the pollinators. And they help pollinate the bananas so we get bananas. But then when they're getting ripe, we don't want the parrots, the bats or the bush turkey. So that's why I bag them. I've made a long pole with a hoop on it so I can put my bag through it in the string and, and, uh, and bag them from standing down on the ground. You can see that on the video here about how I look after bananas. It's pretty easy. But the little birds, I attract the little birds. Once you get a beautiful little ecosystem over here with shade and water, and the little birds, they're going to also help you with the caterpillars and the aphids and stuff like that. So the little birds, they're great to have in the garden. I welcome all the little birds. Like this one. Little willy wagtails. So we're moving right along now to the next, <laughs> to the next problem that we've dealt with here in the weedy garden. And that's the mice and the rats. And the cane toad can also come in this part of the story. Although it's not really a pest for my garden. But I'll tell you about the cane toad in a second. But the problem with the mice and the rats is every time I plant some corn, they'll come and nibble the corn and they'll eat it. And they'll also nibble the little new shoots that come up. So in the beginning, I'd catch them and I'd take them far away to a road, far away from the weedy garden. Okay, this is your station, little mate. Okay, here we go. But then someone that lived down there said I shouldn't do that anymore. So that's fair enough. So then I thought, well, I realized that they were actually really good for the compost. Both rats and mice and cane toads. So, I've got a new philosophy now that everything that comes in my garden stays in my garden and I'll put it to good use. You can see it works because I've got my nice little corn coming up here that haven't been eaten by the rats. The cane toads, they don't bother me. They just hide in the daytime and hunt insects at night. Mostly, they just sit underneath my beehive and, and wait for the sick or dying bees to be thrown off the ledge. You see, they have these juicy little poisonous pimples on their back and any poor forsaken natural Australian species that eats frogs is almost extinct today because they've been eating the cane toads and they're poisonous. The snake, the python snake, the carpet snake, we call her Sally. We call her Sally because they all look the same. She eats her fair share of mice and rats and also keeps them away. I mean, mice and rats, you know, they can talk to each other. So it doesn't take long for the news to spread when Sally's in the weedy garden. The point is though, that all the smaller marsupials, they migrate to different territory when Sally's in the garden. But a big Sally can eat my chooks, or a chicken egg. And the electric fence doesn't keep Sally out from the chickens. Oh, no, it didn't work, look at that. She just went straight through. Sally's in your roost, girls. There we go. See? 
So since I've made it, I've put on this wire bottom so they're nice and safe in here. And also an electric door. There we go. And that opens and closes with the sunlight. So when the sun goes down, the chooks are inside, nice and safe. And when the sun comes up, the chooks come out again. And the poo is really easy to collect because it's just sitting on this netting. So I scrape it all up in the middle and take it out and put it in the garden. Yeah. So when Sally is gone and the mice and the rats have come back and I want to catch them, then I just use peanut butter. It's easy. All you need is a peanut butter and one of these. Oh! Or some peanut butter and one of these. And that'll get it. You can also use some peanut butter and one of these. See inside there I've got some wire. You just get a soda bottle, put a hole in the lid and a hole in the bottom and thread a wire through it and shape it like that so it fits on the bucket. See? Spins around, see? Spins around. You get your peanut butter and you put it on top of the bottle like that. So it smells really nice of peanut butter. And if you want, you can put some uh, grains in there, maybe some chicken food or something like that. If you want to catch the rats, then you need to put a bit of water in the bottom, about that much water, so the rats can't jump out. So you want it so they can crawl up on it, come in and they'll walk on it and they'll fall in to the bucket. And if you don't have something you can put on, it's like you could use a bit of log like that, and then he gets on, where do you go? Oh, and he goes, whoop, and he falls into the bucket. Alrighty, that's how you catch the mouse and the rat. When you look closely at nature, everywhere in nature you see things protecting themselves and things will go to the death to protect what they own and what they have to protect their life. And I kind of feel it's fair. You can do the Findhorn method and say, please mice and please rats don't eat my food. But I tried that and for me it didn't work. But the truth of the matter is you do have to deal with these. And if you don't want to kill them, you can catch them and drive them away and let them go somewhere else. Let someone else deal with them or you can catch them and put them in your compost. I live near a little town in Australia called Kyogle. There are lots of bush turkeys in these hills. Some people call them scrub turkeys or brush turkeys, but the Aborigines, the people who were really connected to this land and have lived here for thousands of years, they call this area Kyogle, which in the Bundjalung language, it means egg of the bush turkey. They're a beautiful bird, very prehistoric, Another wonderful creation of nature, but they are destroying my garden. I'm just going to go for a walk in the bush and I'll show you a nest. So, I'll show you a bush turkey's nest. I've got to walk from the hill down to the creek. Oh, there goes a wallaby. Oh, there he is. Can you see the wallaby? There it is. Oh, there was a goanna. Oh, there it is. See? There's a goanna through the trees there, walking up the tree. No, it's a fair way away. But the bush turkey's nest is up in there, I'll show you. See, that's the bush turkey's nest right there. So what happens is, the bush turkey makes this big compost by scratching all the leaves and twigs and bark and dirt and sand all together in this big pile. He's got this amazing ability to measure the temperature of it. So after he's built it, it gets to a certain temperature and then he calls the female. And the female comes and lays her eggs they dig a hole in here and they lay the, she lays her eggs and then he covers it up again. And then he keeps protecting the nest from any goannas or any dogs or anything like that. And he, um, and he keeps the temperature regulated by taking some off, taking some leaves off or putting some more leaves on. And at some point the little baby chicks will hatch and they'll crawl up through the compost and, and they're on their own from then on. So it's an incredible animal, but if I was a bush turkey, I'd think of all the energy he's used to scratch all this together, I think he'd be much better off just sitting on a nest, making a nice little cosy nest and then just chilling. I'm going to just stick my hand down here and, and, and see if it's getting some sort of a temperature difference. Oh yeah, I can feel it's getting warm in here. I can. I can feel the deeper I go, the warmer it's getting. It would be funny if I found that bush turkey egg, but I shouldn't disturb the nest. Although I feel like making revenge on the bush turkey and digging up this whole nest, I won't do that. I just wanted to show you the nest. So I'll go back up to the garden and show you how I prevented them digging up my garden. Because they don't want to nest in my garden, they're looking for food in the weedy garden. And they'll go after the root vegetables like sweet potatoes, yakon, cassava. 
and they made a destruction of my garden one year. I went away to Denmark for a few weeks and came back and they dug all my cassava, all my yakon, all my sweet potato, all my taro, all my, all my root vegetables were gone. I did start with using the teddy bears, but they only worked for about a month. So goodbye teddy bear. <laughs> you know what? I found a better solution and that's just a bit of mesh on top of everything. Check this out. Down here, I've got my new little yakon coming up. Some mesh over it. It's a good idea to make it big enough so the yakon can get through. So you don't want to use chicken wire or bird wire because then, then your plant's going to suffocate and get cut off, right? So that stops the bush turkey there. And see here, I've got the same mesh here. It's bent over about here to here. And my cassava's coming up through it, see? It's very dry here at the moment. I've got to give this some water. But other than that, I think the bush turkey and I have found peace because the bush turkey can't dig up what it likes to eat anymore. This is the bandicoot. It has teeth like a tiny crocodile and claws like Edward Scissorhand. The bandicoot though is very smart. Like any of the other wildlife that have lived here around this hill somewhere before I got here, the bandicoot finally found out that this was the best place in the area for worms. So then I went and got a ping fence. This is a ping fence. I got it from the same place I bought the electric fence. This one here, which is uh, Shore Guard, and you can find them on my website. But this one is to keep out the cats from the garden and dogs, teeth of dogs inside the garden. But the guy who has the company, Derek, he showed me a video where it kept the rats out. It did keep the rats out. See, I've been trying different things to keep the bandicoots out, including this little electric fence. You wouldn't think a bandicoot could get through this, could you? But it does. See, the bandicoot's not interested in digging up my food. It's interested in eating worms. But, and it doesn't care about the, my seedlings in the process. I couldn't find anything on Google how to deal with the bandicoots, so I put a call out on Facebook to see if anyone had any good ideas to keep the bandicoot away. And there was lots of comments. Try chicken poo. So I tried chicken poo. That didn't work. Try coffee grounds, they say. So I tried coffee grounds, but that didn't work. You see where he's been here, I see. Bandicoot's just been digging up everything. Someone said try bunya pine needles. They weren't like that. So I'm putting some of these bunya needles down here. They're from the bunya pine. It's the leaf from the bunya pine. And it didn't work. So I felt a bit silly, but I bought myself a trap. And I put some peanut butter in there. That didn't work. Someone said try blood and bone. So I did. And that didn't work. So I tried with a big handful of worms straight out of my worm farm. That didn't work either. You can see it's been digging all around the cage. See, but it hasn't been in the cage. This is when I bought the bird wire. And I used all day putting it up and half the night. The funny thing is the bandicoot, he doesn't climb up. They won't climb over this like a rat. They'll come and they'll try and find their way in, but they won't find their way in. So when they hit the fence, they can't get through, they don't go in. But then it got in underneath the fence, see like here? I think it was getting in underneath here or somewhere. So I'll have to just tie that on a bit stronger. But so I fixed that. They never got back in. Yeah, so there was a guessing competition on my last episode to see how many times the bandicoot had been digging in these garden beds since I put up my fence. The competition is officially closed now. Do you know how many winners there were in the competition? Zero. The correct answer was zero. So there's about 250 correct answers. So all the winners that guessed the right answer, send me an email to theweedygardenwinner at gmail.com and I'll send you um, the movie, as promised. But if you weren't a lucky winner, you can always still get my movie on my website, theweedygarden.com. Okay, so congratulations to everyone who was using their brains. That's good. I'm glad you're paying attention. Hope you enjoyed this video. 
Maybe you don't have bush turkeys or carpet snakes or bandicoots around you, but I'm sure you'd be able to use some of these tricks or tips to keep whatever is bothering you away from your garden. Okay, so hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed the video. The next video, I'm gonna upload a children's friendly version or classroom friendly version of my movie, Down the Carrot Hole. And that'll be called Weedy's Garden. So look out for that next weekend. Have a nice day, everybody. Enjoy your lives. Enjoy your gardens. Enjoy your lives. It's important. Have a nice day and I'll catch you later.